Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares with the top economic reports on today's show. Volatility in the ruble may indicate more trouble ahead for Russia. And as China rises internationally, its domestic sorrows may get in the way. First, the headlines. A new plan by the Financial Stability Board forces the world's largest banks to maintain a sizable capital cushion in case of crisis. The world's top 30 banks will have to hold 16 to 20 percent of their risk-weighted assets in equity and cancelable debt. Banks will issue debt that can easily be absorbed to pay losses in times of a crisis to avoid burdening taxpayers. The Basel-based board aims to finalize the proposal by the next time G20 leaders meet in 2015. Banks would have to implement the rule by 2019 at the earliest. Russia and China signed an agreement for a major gas supply deal that would make China its biggest gas customer. Under the new gas deal worth $400 billion, Russia will sell an additional 30 billion cubic meters of gas to China for 30 years. Putin has ordered an eastward shift for the country's economy to avoid isolation following the imposition of Western sanctions over the Ukraine crisis. For China, the increased gas imports allow it to wean itself off its dependence on coal as it embarks on its war on pollution. As China and Korea effectively concluded a free trade agreement on Monday, South Koreans were divided on the prospects of the New Deal. South Korean farmers and activists protested against the free trade agreement with China, although business people said they welcomed it. Though the agreement follows two years of negotiations, there remains some skepticism in South Korea about it passing through parliament. Since China and South Korea normalized diplomatic relations in 1992, bilateral trade has grown 36-fold to $229 billion in 2013 from just $6.4 billion in 1992. We welcome our country's effectiveness in reaching a free trade agreement with our largest trading partner, China. The FTA with China, which is the number one trading country and the second largest economy in the world, will be the growth engines for our industry and economy. South Korean agriculture has been precarious even without the free trade agreement. Needless to say, the FTA will aggravate the situation. U.S. authorities joined the investigation into foul play at Brazil's biggest company, Petrobras, which has emerged as one of the country's biggest corruption cases. The authorities are looking into whether Petrobras or its employees violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which makes it illegal to bribe foreign officials to win or retain business. Prosecutors in Brazil allege that Petrobras overinflated the cost of projects and acquisitions and paid part of the proceeds to politicians from the ruling Workers' Party coalition. Many of the alleged problems occurred when President Dilma Rousseff was head of the company before taking office in 2011. Catalonia's nationalist government vowed to step up its secession drive following a successful, though symbolic, independence referendum. More than two million Catalans divide a Spanish court and voted overwhelmingly in favor of independence on Sunday. Catalonia has lately become harder for Madrid to control as scores of towns and villages have unilaterally declared themselves free and sovereign territory. The breakaway movement in Catalonia, which accounts for one-fifth of Spain's economic output, grew in strength during the recent years of deep recession. Today, more than two million Catalans have voted on our independence despite the obstacles imposed by the Spanish government that denies us the right to vote for independence. Our journey towards self-determination is irreversible. We Basques should be jealous because we should be working to demand the right to vote in the same way they are doing it here. Russia's currency slid to a historic low, losing over 10 percent in value in the course of last week amid plunging oil prices and the fallout over Ukraine. Though the ruble rebounded slightly on Monday, many fear a fresh financial crisis for Russia. I-24 News reporter Dallin Roth tells us why. 
Last week was rough on Russia's ruble when the currency hit an all-time low, shedding 10% of its value from the beginning of the week as oil prices have been falling, a key factor in the Russian economy, and the Ukraine crisis took its toll. The situation has left Russians in a panic. The weakening of the ruble, of course for Russian citizens, is really sad, putting it mildly. That is, as a rule, a large amount of Russians receive salaries in rubles naturally. Money is devaluing, but groceries and all the rest aren't getting cheaper. That is, crudely speaking, we remain in poverty. The Russian foreign minister suggested that the drop in value could be chalked up to negative speculation and nothing else. But the ruble has lost almost 30 percent against the dollar since the beginning of 2014, and not many are buying the story that Russian authorities are in control of the slide. One of the reasons why the market is very nervous is because the market doesn't have good understanding what the central bank take over the situation. And in a way, the market have impression that maybe central bank itself is in a panic. With oil prices down, Russia has turned to pushing up property taxes and small business taxes to help bolster public finances. As the prices of foreign currencies grow, consumers find that they are spending more and more on food, which is a sector already under embargo imposed by Russia in response to sanctions over the Ukraine crisis. Food spending is up, even as total spending is falling, according to the consumer behavior tracking agency Romir Monitoring. Russia may be in dire straits looking forward. The government has enough money to spend for the next year. But after that, uh, we don't have enough money to support uh, the budget expenses. Under uh, the geopolitical problems we have, we face, uh, there is no possibility you know, to borrow so much money as like 2% of GDP. Right now, year-on-year -year spending adjusted for inflation is down 10 percent and vacation travel is down up to 50 percent, according to Russia's tourism union. There doesn't seem to be a holiday on the horizon for Russia. We move on now to our innovation corner where Natalie Ehrlich makes yet another attempt at explaining how Bitcoin works and why it matters. Well, this is Innovation at I-24 News. I'm Natalie Ehrlich. You may have heard of Bitcoin, a new global payment rail. Buttercoin is now building a system, making it possible to move between currencies through Bitcoin. The Silicon Valley startup recently went public and enjoys backing from Google Ventures as well as Y Combinator. Now, for further insight, we're joined by the company's CEO, Cedric Dahl. Thank you very much for joining us. First of all, what is a Bitcoin? So... A Bitcoin is a discovery which has enabled something which has never before in the history of mankind been possible. It allows people who do not know each other or trust each other to agree that something is true at the same time. This core innovation is called the blockchain, and it might be the most important thing we've ever seen since the invention of penicillin or the Internet. And where does Buttercoin come into all of this? How does it actually fit into this Bitcoin ecosystem? Sure. So Buttercoin is the foundation upon which we're able to build money highways, where you can have on and off ramps from one country's currency to another country's currency going through this highway uh, that is Buttercoin. And, and Buttercoin really enables this through the technology of the blockchain, through Bitcoin. So it almost sounds like a money transfer. Can you elaborate? Certainly. So think about the way that money transfers happen today. You go to Western Union, you pay percentages up to 15% to send your own money to the people that you care about. Well, with Bitcoin, you're able to spend pennies instead of percentages to send your own money to your friends, family, and people that you care about. Well, the World Bank estimates that the global remittances are worth over $500 billion, so it is quite sizable and potentially highly lucrative. How is Buttercoin looking to seize on this opportunity? You can think of our plan like a three-course meal. You have the appetizer, main course, and dessert. For the appetizer, Buttercoin is building a U.S.-based marketplace. Uh, for the main course, we're building marketplaces around the world. Think of these like nodes in a network. And for dessert, we connect the nodes, which enables instant cross-border remittances effectively for free. Okay, well, moving now back to Bitcoins, this is a virtual currency. It hasn't been recognized by any nation or backed by any bank. So what do you say to the skeptics? Well, it's important to look at Bitcoin as a payment rail. It's a 
way that merchants can receive payment for items without necessarily receiving a fiat currency. It's a way that people can send value um, from themselves to someone else. But it's not necessarily a currency. That's an important distinction. Bitcoin's a payment rail. Now, when it comes to the skeptics out there, typically people fear what they don't understand. And initially, Bitcoin was very difficult to understand because the people talking about it were very technical. What's happening now is that people who are able to take these big technical ideas and transform them into understandable scenarios that people can understand where they'll benefit from, um, it's becoming much clearer that Bitcoin is an incredible innovation which has the opportunity to dramatically improve people's lives. And lastly, with your recent launch, what are the next steps for the company? Uh, right now, we're in the appetizer phase of our plans, so we're building a U.S.-based marketplace, and next, we'll be building Bitcoin marketplaces around the world. Well, thank you very much for joining us, BetterCoin CEO Cedric Dahl, coming straight to us from Palo Alto in California. Very much appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Is China's growing re regional leadership undermining Obama's pivot? As APEC meets in Beijing for the first time since China's paramount leader Xi Jinping took office, the gathering also boosts China as a regional and world leader. But could China's own economy undermine its ambitions? I-24 News reporter Dallin Roth has the report. On the occasion of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, the Chinese premier tried to put the economic slowdown into perspective because although growth is expected not to exceed 7.5% in 2014, the lowest increase in nearly 25 years, this rate is among the highest in the world. Under the new normal conditions, China's economic growth has become more stable and driven by more diverse forces. Some people worry that China's economy will fall further can it climb over the ridge? There are indeed risks, but they are not that scary. Wage costs are becoming higher and productivity is becoming lower, due primarily to the decline in exports. In October, exports rose 11.6 percent against 15 percent over the previous month, a situation the Chinese government has its eyes on, particularly planning to intensify the reforms initiated by the government. Once the bow is drawn, the arrow cannot be put back in the quiver. We will resolutely deepen reform. To comprehensively deepen reform, we need to stimulate market vitality. Market vitality comes from the people, especially from business leaders and their entrepreneurship. And to achieve its objectives, Xi Jinping is putting a lot of weight on a Chinese presence abroad. It is estimated that China's outbound investment will total over $1.25 trillion over the next 10 years. Meanwhile, over the next five years, China will import over 10 trillion worth of goods and the number of outbound Chinese tourists will also exceed 500 million. For the Asian Pacific and the world at large, China's development will generate huge opportunities and benefits and hold lasting and infinite promise. The challenge ahead, according to some economists, is that actual Chinese growth could be well below the official forecast, hovering as low as 1 to 2 percent. Until recent months, the industry decline, a victim of high production costs, was offset by major construction. In Beijing, between 2000 and 2013, prices multiplied by three. This encouraged bank lending and encouraged domestic demand, but the government had to intervene to limit local government debt. The result is that, according to many experts, the Chinese real estate bubble is about to burst. And now for a discussion of a variety of reports we collected for you in Media Watch with Daniel Roth. So, Daniel, it's all about Berlin, right? Yes, you may have heard the Berlin Wall came down. It did? Yes, oh. uh, 25 years ago yesterday. Oh, okay, this is what, yeah. Uh, it was a little while ago. Uh, but here's the thing, actually. There's a lot of reports from places like Business Week mm. and Fortune and Foreign Policy, not usual suspects, that are kind of, they're pointing to the fact that communism may have not been the worst economic choice. So they, they're talking about like uh, examples like in Bulgaria where growth between the late 30s and mm. late 80s actually outstripped the US. Average annual growth was better there than in the US. Uh, they point to examples like in Hungary where actually uh, income went down by and large under communism, but right. continued to go down after communism ended there. So you can't really blame it on that. They look, it's, it's you know, when you look at actually the issue of growth, mm -hmm. uh, growth in, in the Eastern Bloc 
wasn't doing bad. It was even doing better in a lot of ways uh, than than in in non. Soviet countries, right? Uh, and it's so in purely economic terms, but I mean, certainly it wasn't necessarily better for the people. Or did it discuss that? Absolutely. And so there's, this also comes up, of course. So one of the things, one of the theses here is that growth cannot be the marker of what is a good economy. Because mm -hmm. if you look at mm -hmm. communism, you look at capitalism, there's different different uh, growth numbers, but you can find You're ways. Doing poorly, but you know. Yeah, it's <laughs> no <laughs> nobody's doing great is the point. But uh, but actually, uh, the income, I the real issue uh, about lifting people up out of poverty is about right. income disparity. It's about the 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 sort of the wealth gaps that grow, and you can see wealth gaps in both systems, uh, but. But you know, one of the things they also point mm. to is that the real inspiration for knocking down the wall, the reason that people in NGOs uh, across the Soviet Union pushed for this, mm -hmm. was that they wanted this mix. They okay. wanted some freedom and they wanted some social justice. Okay, well, I'm going to take the freedom to end here mm -hmm. because we are out of time. Thanks, Daniel Roth, for joining us. That's The Economy Magazine. Benjamin Chalafaris, thanks for joining us. Joining us again tomorrow.